when the fivefold ministry vision began to unfold. And in fact, somebody let me know when Brother Kleindienst and Brother Cunningham are in the, in the room. Um, I've not shared this yet, I don't believe, but about 14 years ago, I asked Brother Bernard if we could start having a conversation about the fivefold ministry. So the first unofficial gathering was in Brother Anthony Mangan's office, the Tuesday morning of Because of the Times. Bishop Bernard was there, T.F. Tenney, Anthony Mangan, Mark Morgan, Doug Kleindens, Jason Sisko, and two or three others. And we just had a round, <clears throat> a round table conversation about the fivefold ministry. And from there, Brother Bernard had us do a closed minister session on the fivefold ministry. Brother Mangan, Brother Cisco, Brother Kleindens were the panel at General Conference, I would say 10 years ago. And then several seminars at General Conference. How many's ever been to a five-fold ministry seminar at General Conference? Three people, praise God. Well, more than that. But they've, they've given us a double room, it's been packed. And then two years ago, was anybody at the Orlando General Conference? Thank you. So, Brother Bernard gave us Friday night and we made a presentation of Apostle, Prophet, Evangelist, Pastor, Teacher, the Friday night service of General Conference. And I have to tell you, I have never seen the bishop act like he acted that Friday night. He was dancing and shouting and worshiping across that stage uh, in his fivefold ministry authority and there was such a powerful impartation. And to this day, people will still make comments about what happened. Here's what's going on. And I say this with all the humility of Brother Raymond Woodward's message today. And that is that God is pleased with what all of us are trying to do. We're trying to get it right. And from the beginning, it's amazing to see what has happened this morning. Speak heaven's prayer request, Sister Shaw. Be clothed with the humility of Jesus Christ so that people can see the face of the Lord in the fivefold ministry. I hope you'll take a piece of that styrofoam cup. Just crush it, but then take a piece of it. Put it in your pocket and take it home. You need to have a little souvenir place in your prayer room. Amen. Little mementos that remind you of those life-changing moments. And then we've come, we've come full circle today in Brother Herring's ministry about releasing and unleashing the saints to do the work of the ministry. <clears throat> God has not empowered the fivefold ministry to train people how to plunge toilets and cut grass and paint walls and you know put light bulbs in. And we thank God all that has to be done. But the primary work of the ministry is to go reach the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we are partners. Come on, clap your hands if you believe we're partners. I want the, uh, the panel to please join me on the platform. They should know who they are. Please join me. Brother Kleindens, we prayed for you. We're so glad that you're here. Let's stretch our hands toward him again and ask God to finish the healing recovery right now, Lord. Touch Brother Kleindens in body, soul, and spirit. 
Lord, I pray that whatever has come against him, that it will leave now. I take authority over it in Jesus' name. Lord, I'm speaking healing and recovery right now. In the name of Jesus, let it be so. And we give you glory in Jesus' name. Praise God. Praise God. So, let's see. Uh, Brother Evans, where did my iPad go? There it is. Thank you. I'll stay there. Yeah, thank you. So, Brother Herring, really, and at the other two conferences, we've not had a release of the saints like we have had in this conference. And I am so excited to see what God is going to do. And when the saints begin to do the work of the ministry, lay hands on the sick, cast out devils, come on, baptize. If your pastor trains you to baptize, go baptize. If your pastor qualifies you to baptize, go baptize. Praise God. If you're under authority, you'll have authority. Praise God. And we will never reach the world without the saints doing the ministry. Never. And so we thank God for this release today. Maybe one of these days we'll really get back to the book of Acts all the way. Clap your hands if you believe we're on our way. I can't say in Kansas City yet that we've turned the world upside down, but it was said of the first century church. I can't say yet that we filled all of Kansas City with our doctrine, but it was said of the church in Jerusalem, they'd fill the city with their doctrine. Right? In two years, all Asia heard the word. That's the nation of Turkey today. We can't do it without the saints. When the saints start preaching, the world will hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Praise God. Amen. If you're under it, you'll have it. And the Lord will be with you. So, uh, once again, let's receive and welcome this panel this morning. Would you thank the Lord for them today? And so, uh, we... As a panel, we have prayed, and we've operated in the prophetic, and we have discerned your questions. <laughs> so we will not be receiving live, on-the-spot questions uh, this morning, but we've done this enough that we think we know what some of the questions are. But panel, pay attention, because I'm going to put a question out here right now that we have never considered before. But I know the Lord is going to help us. Now, sometimes we have to uh, adjust and bring correction from other, let's say, religious and Christian voices and sources because we are the apostolic church. We are not the historic we, we don't read the Bible through the lens that the historic church reads the Bible through. And we, we, we read the lens, we read through the lens that the, the same lens that the writers of the New Testament read their Bible through, and that's the lens of the Old Testament. We don't look at church history to interpret the Bible. We let the Bible interpret itself. And amen. So, in case there is some misunderstanding or misinformation, here's the question I want to start with. And I apologize, panel, that I did not prepare you ahead of time. But there is a feeling in some Christian circles that the fivefold ministry uh, can operate in the saints those who are not called 
to the fivefold ministry, but there is a sort of a saint version of apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. Maybe you've never heard this, maybe you've never seen this, but just in case there's some confusion in someone's mind, I want the panel to comment on what is the difference, for example, if a saint is a leader, you know, maybe they might think they're an apostle. Or if they, you know, sons and daughters shall prophesy. And let's say the gift of prophecy. What is the difference between the fivefold ministry version of a prophet and a saint that prophesies? Or same with a teacher. What is the difference between a fivefold ministry teacher and a teacher in a Sunday school class, for example? Or an evangelist. People have the gift of evangelist, but they're not in the fivefold ministry. So let's speak to this, and I think this might bring some clarity and definition. So who would like to start? Who's got a word, an understanding? Bishop of the house, we'll let you start. He's got the high back chair. I knew this was going to happen. The I agree and disagree, both. I, for example, last night told you that there are very clear criteria in the Bible for being an apostle. Part of that criteria is taking new territory, identifying training, sending men into ministry, starting churches, uh, having spiritual authority to break the back of the devil. All of this is in the scripture. There is no scripture for a person who is a leader in a local church being able to call themselves an apostle. And so I don't agree that that exists. There's no example of it in the scripture that I'm aware of that there's a local church person that, that was ever called an apostle. Now, I also, with all due respect, disagree uh, with the idea that a Sunday school teacher may not be a a five-fold ministry teacher. I do believe that there are teachers uh, within the church. We got great teachers in our church. We couldn't have the revival we're having if we didn't have a host of great teachers. And we've got teachers that are greatly anointed in the local church. So I really do think they are part of the five-fold ministry. We've got Bible study teachers that are obviously anointed. Where's Kelsey Wilkins at? Stand up so they can see you. This guy, this guy, out of 52 weeks, we baptize people 26 of those 52 weeks probably during the week that he teaches a Bible study to, brings them to the church and baptizes them. He has a special anointing for teaching Bible studies. Thank you, Brother Kessler. He brought a guy up here to be baptized recently and I said, Kelsey, where'd you meet him? He said, I was sitting on my front porch drinking tea uh, iced tea, and the guy's walking down the street, and I said, hey, buddy, you want a glass of tea? The guy come up on the porch, he gave him a glass of tea, taught him Bible study, brought him over here and baptized him. So I think there are people who are teachers that are anointed, and God uses them, puts them in the right places. Uh, I went to Hawaii last year. I preached for a guy that has three churches. I said, man, you're doing great. Open three churches. He said, I did it all at Starbucks. I said, what do you mean you did it at Starbucks? He said, I go to Starbucks in three different cities on a rotation every day of the week. He said, I take my Bible with me and I take my Bible study chart. I open my Bible and I set the Bible study chart up, the little small chart. And he said, I never ask anybody. I wait till someone asks me. Oh, you got your Bible open or oh, what's that chart? And he said, when they ask, I invite them to sit down and nearly everybody I've won in all three churches I've won at Starbucks by teaching. And so that is, I, I think there, there's a lot of people can participate in teaching. It's going to be a smaller number that end up being pastors, a smaller number that end up being evangelists. In fact, I think of all the five-fold ministry, we may have less real evangelists than any of the other five-fold ministries. Guys that are committed to being an evangelist are really the heroes, in my mind, in our fellowship. There's nobody making a bigger sacrifice to be used by God than our evangelists. But I think as you go up the line, you're gonna see less, 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 less. And I'll stick with what I said before. I only know about five or six apostles 
that are alive today. I heard somebody say recently, we're going to have 100 teenage apostles. That would be wonderful. It's just not scriptural. And so I love y'all, but it, 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 the more you go up that line, the less it is. We just had Rear Admiral the Navy Thomas in church with us. And, and he's a great guy. But there's James... How many admirals would there be today? 180 admirals. How many sailors are there? 350,000 sailors, 180 admirals. And we have no five-star admirals right now at all. Zero. There's no five-star admirals. The higher you go, the less the number is of the leadership. So that's just... And Brother Kleindens, what would be the difference between a prophet, a fivefold ministry prophet, and a saint of God that operates in prophecy? Well, in answer to that, and I think it bleeds over into the first, much larger question, there's a difference between function, operation, and office. And to me, the big difference is somebody may have a strong gift of teaching or a strong gift of prophecy, but are they going to reprove, rebuke, and correct the body? Do we feel like they also should bring that kind of correction and admonition to the body? Probably not. They have right. this gifting or ability from God, like the nine spiritual gifts in Corinthians and in uh, Romans. But the, if you took the fivefold ministry, if you call them gifts or offices, out, we have no way to govern. How is the body governed? Where are the decisions made? Where is the authority administrated? Who corrects? Who rebukes? Who sits down? Who lifts up? Who identifies? Who approves? So the fivefold ministry, even in teaching, now, like, is everybody that teaches a Bible study a fivefold ministry teacher? Well, then is everybody that teaches their children at home a teacher? You, you have to draw a line, and I think the line is not function, but office, a, a spiritual authority to lead, direct, that needs to be obeyed by the body. So I had a friend of mine recently was talking to me about these prophets in their church and prophetesses in their church. And I just asked, if, I said, hold on a second. Would you put these people up in a service and let them minister and correct the body? Would you trust them? Oh, no, 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 no. I said, then they're not prophets and prophetesses. They have the gift of prophecy. They have that anointing from the Lord. This is good. So, yes, sir. I could add to that for one second. What Brother Woodward did today, remember when I walked out, I told you he's the greatest teacher alive today that I know. I don't believe there's a better teacher than Raymond Woodward anywhere. <laughs> but I can tell you, I would pull the coattail of a saint that got up and said exactly the same words Brother Woodward was saying. I would tell them they were out of order. He's not out of order because he operates in that spiritual authority. But God does not authorize everybody in the body to correct the leadership. I would like to add another statement to that there. In the fivefold, because we're submitted one to another. In other words, so it, I'll just use uh, office of the prophet. If you're operating in the office of the prophet, well, who's going to correct you? If, if Raymond Woodward came to me and said, Brother Klein, that's great, great message, joy what you said, but, but I need to show you something, correct something you said. I would listen to that and I would submit to that because I feel here is a five-fold ministry teacher that is going to bring Very a correction good. to my understanding. Very good. And so who's going to correct us? We do it amongst ourselves being submitted back and forth. That's excellent. Any of the other panel want to make a comment on this question about uh, the saints, in the, you know, being in the part of the fivefold ministry versus uh, the governing authority? Brother Woodward, do you have a comment on this? I would revert back to Brother Kleinitz comment, our comments together from yesterday, there's a difference between a, a gift and a role. The gift is given by God, but the role is recognized and authorized by the church. So without that, uh, you need to stay under the submission of your pastor and for most people within the confines of your local church. But here's the thing, Paul tells us to abide in the calling wherewith we are called. 
we, we've got a little bit too much uh, uh, Instagram celebrity fame floating around today. <laughs> And so the devil will talk in your ear and say, you're not doing anything for God unless somebody pulls you outside of your local church and invites you to speak at some meeting in another state. That is, what's the word, bogus? Whatever it is, it's just not right. Because uh, submission is the key. If you're not submitted to the authority of your pastor, uh, you, you've missed the whole boat. So uh, you can have a powerful gift of teaching. You can have a powerful gift. Pastoring, uh, pastoring means shepherding. Uh, we have people in our church at home that they have a gift for helping us shepherd that congregation. They would faint dead away if we stood them on the platform and put them behind the pulpit. That's not where they are, but they have a gift to help the pastor pastor. They care for people that I would never have a chance to touch. They're, they're, they're helping us pastor. There are people in this church that have helped us this week that if you saw them here at Bible World every week, they're helping their pastor pastor this great congregation. That's a gift. That's not a role. The gift is given by God, and we need to use it in that context. The role has to be recognized and authorized by the body. I love it. Amazing. So I think Brother Woodward and Brother Kleinitz pulled this out of something that he said. It should be noted that if you're a called fivefold ministry person, that you should, first of all, be called by the Holy Spirit, sent by the Holy Spirit. And this is the model of Acts 13. The Holy Ghost said, separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And they're not as yet called apostles, but you might as well mark it down. If they're being sent as missionaries, they're going to begin to operate in apostleship. In fact, when they go, the next chapter, chapter 14, verses 4 and 14, they are called apostles when they start doing the work and the ministry of the apostle with signs, wonders, and mighty deeds. And so like Brother Cunningham preached last night, none of the men that he esteemed as apostle called themselves apostle. They simply were sent by the Holy Ghost and sent by the church. Right, there you go. And sent by the church. And that brings up the accountability piece. When Paul and Barnabas went out, they were funded, the word sent includes in the range of meaning, financed and provided for. When they came back, they came back to the church that sent them and reported to them what God had done. And of course the saints could rejoice. And so the fivefold ministry should be sent by the Holy Ghost and they should be sent and affirmed by the church. You believe that? Amen. Clap your hands if you believe it. Comment? All right. So let's go to another uh, question. And I'm sure this is a question in someone's mind during this conference. First of all, how do you know that you're called by God into the fivefold ministry? And then secondly, how do you discern what your gift is or your office is in the fivefold ministry? Is that something you know instantly? Is that something that develops? How is it affirmed, confirmed? So Brother Cisco, I would like for you to start with this. How do you know if you're called to the fivefold ministry and how do you begin to discover in what role of the fivefold ministry you're called to? It's a great, great, great question. I think it, I think it varies, you know, on the person and on the function. Uh, there's different experiences. You hear that Jeremiah, he said, "You're a prophet to the nation. I called you from your mother's womb." God just told him very plainly, and gave him specific details of what he was going to do, you know, to build up, tear down, uproot, plant. I mean, all these things he said he was going to do. Um, I, I. Feel like my debt might just in a very practical sense. Um, not everybody has that same clarity. I guess is what I'm trying to say. Uh, my dad always said to me, "You need a benchmark." Of course, you, you're talking to you know. I was eight. Uh, I felt like I was called to preach. 
Son, what do you think you're gonna do with your life? Well, I think I'm gonna be a preacher. He said, well, that's not good enough. You can't just think that, that you might. He said, because it's gonna get tested. There's gonna be a point when you're gonna question whether you were ever called or not. And if you don't have a benchmark where you can go back and say, without a doubt, I know on this day, God called me to be a preacher. He said, that, you, you don't have enough yet. And so you need to pray. So he told me, he said, God will give you a vision or he will bring a confirmation to you. And so he, and I was like, well, what's a vision? Well, I mean, I'm eight, nine years old, whatever. He said, well, you walk through a door and then you see things you've never seen before. Well, I took it very literal. Every time I would walk through a doorway, I would look around, you know, like, it's like all the same stuff I saw the last time I was here. You know, I didn't know what it, very, very literal. But I just kept praying, okay, God, I think I'm called to preach. I feel like I'm called to preach. But Lord, I, I don't know if that's what you want for me. I feel that desire, but I don't, the Bible says he that desireth the office of the bishop, desires a good thing, but there should be qualifications. There should be certain amount of fruit in your life that will verify, and then as we were talking about, it gets conferred, it's not who commends himself, but whom the Lord commends. So after God confirms it to you, there will be a specific moment. I can tell you where I was standing. I was at junior camp in Wisconsin camp, and. Uh, there was a beautiful story about Joseph for the whole week, and on the last night, the song was Dream a Dream If You Dare To, and at the end, the speaker just said, whatever you dream, that's what God will make you. And I walked to the front, and I said, God, I don't know if it really works like that, but I, I wanna be a preacher. I don't know if you want me to be a preacher, but that's my dream. And I closed my eyes, and that's when I went through that open door my dad was talking about. And I saw myself in the future and I heard myself say two things. If you need to be healed, I know a God that can heal you. If you need to be saved, I know a God that can save you. And I saw a massive group of people and they all started running to the, to the altar and then all of a sudden I opened my eyes and I was back at junior camp. And I thought, I know it right now. I'm gonna, I'm gonna help a lot of people get the Holy Ghost. I'm gonna help a lot of people get healed. I don't know when it's gonna happen or how it's gonna happen, but this is what God's gonna do in my ministry. And I got so excited, I thought, you know, I'd, I'd have to travel with a bus, you know, and I'd leave in school and all this, you know, of course it didn't happen. <laughs> Still waiting on that vision, specific vision that I saw to happen. But I believe that God in your calling will give you seeds of what you're going to do. When I talk about calling, it's God standing in your future, showing you your maturest, most uh, fulfilled place in ministry, and then you are standing in your present, and he calls you. He says, this is what you're ultimately going to be. Notice in Acts 13, wherewith I have called. They were called early on, but they were functioning much less than what their apostolic actual commissioning was. They were commissioned to be apostles in Acts 13, but God called Paul in Acts 9. So you're, there's a difference between calling and commissioning. And so in between that calling and commissioning is when all the affirmations come, that's when the character is built, when the process of submission, humility, working with the body, learning your skills, three years in Arabia, being a tent maker, an entrepreneur, he has to have a skill set for being able to travel and support himself as he's establishing new churches. All these things are essential and then God sends Barnabas to him and says, it's time, and he becomes the lowest ranking teacher in Antioch. It was Barnabas and Saul was mentioned last. And then later on, it's Barnabas and Saul, and then it's Barnabas and Paul, and then it's Paul and Barnabas. And then Barnabas goes to his next assignment. So I believe that there is a progression of getting more and more clarity as you obey and as you submit, and as you follow. But in the very beginning, God will give you seeds. He will show you like he showed Joseph at 17, but he didn't actually see the fulfillment until he was 30. Does that Amen. make sense? That's great. Thank the Lord. I hope that helps. For the woodwork. I don't want to jump in and belabor the point, but this is very personal to me. Like Abraham had to give up his son of promise, sometimes God will test you and he will ask you to give up your dream, so to speak. Yes. I was raised in a family of teachers. My father was the high school principal in our city for years. Uh, my sister's a teacher. My daughter's a teacher. I was setting out to be a teacher and I graduated from high school. I had scholarships, it was all set. It wasn't that I felt pressured to be that, I wanted to be that. I wasn't thinking teaching at a meeting like this. I was thinking about teaching in public school. 
And I remember the conversation that I had with the Lord, and it was very, sorry, I'm also a crier, which is not very cool. Um, <laughs> I, I had a conversation with the Lord. It was very emotional for me. And I knew what God was doing. He was pulling me to Bible college. And if you had seen the Bible college in our city, you wouldn't have been impressed at that time. And uh, the buildings were old, and I just didn't want to go there. And I had a conversation with God and said, okay, God, I give up my dream of teaching. I give it up to you. Mm. And I walked away, and I went to Bible school. And I didn't go there to be a preacher. I did everything else. I helped. I served. I did whatever I could. Um, and I remember, uh, it's in my journal somewhere. I don't remember the date, but I could look it up. I was somewhere overseas in Singapore or Australia, somewhere it was in the Pacific or, or Asia. And the Lord spoke to me in a hotel room and said, so you gave up teaching for me, did you? <laughs> and it was 10 years into this, this business. And I really feel like sometimes God will ask you to lay it down because you can get your dream or your vision in front of the will of God. Watch this happen to so many saints where their pastor hasn't released them yet and they look around for another minister, another pastor, another word to release them and it's premature and it's destructive to the body. And if you will submit, Joseph had the greatest, grandest dreams of anybody in the Old Testament up till that point and God threw him in a pit his brothers threw him, but God was doing that. Uh, God sent him to Egypt all to prepare. Joseph couldn't know that he, God was backing him into his promise. He had no idea. But if you watch Joseph, he doesn't become bitter. He just serves everybody else's dream. Potiphar's dream, the jailer's dream, and finally Pharaoh's dream. And then Joseph ends up on the throne of Egypt. And if you will be patient and if you will submit, and if, you will, if you've got such a call, work that call in your local church. If you've got such a ministry, work that ministry in your local church. Thank you. Very much. Brother Herring, would you like to speak to the I was just going to say something similar. I think we all look through our own lenses of our own experiences, but Joseph... Uh, he, his dream, he chased it for years, but until he understood the king's dream and then united himself to the king's dream, nothing changed. And I remember when I felt called to preach that, that, that I told my dad, I, it was a burning desire to evangelize. And he said, two years, you're going to, you'll preach here in the church. You'll take up the offering. You'll preach. You'll do altar calls. You'll do different things find a job. And in two years, I think the Lord will release you. And th those two years, we just worked on building his dream, his church. But at the end of that two year mark, he said, okay, it's time to go and go evangelize. In the next 20 years, it was unleashed. I think there's a very important key of submitting to the pastor's dream, understanding it, uniting yourself to it. That launches you into your dream. Amen. That's great. So I think to add to this conversation right now about the call of the fivefold ministry, of course, I'm checking your powers of observation, but how many have noticed that we have a female on the panel? Yeah. <laughs> and she serves with great class and dignity. She always gives honor to God, to her husband, and her pastor, and Sister Shaw, you're such a great model of a female operating in your gift and in the fivefold ministry. Sorry. Uh, talk to us a little bit about what that looks and feels like for you and how it happened. Well, it first um, began with, I would say, submission and commission. I'm on, okay, <laughs> are very important factors. Number one, submitting to God, hearing from God. Um, initially, when it started for me, it was in prayer. I think many things are birthed in prayer because that's your communication and your relationship with God. God will speak to you so that you will have confidence and know that he has called you. But you must go through the uh, order of authority and so when the Lord initially called me as a young single lady, 
I, I held it in my heart for a while. I continued to pray and to serve, serve in the church. Then there was a, a recognized prophet of God that approached me in prayer and mentioned the call that God had spoken to me about. That was a confirmation. And I mentioned a little bit this morning, a door opened when I was fatally ill and God healed me. I was invited to revival. Kathy Wellman, stand up. She was the one that invited me. She was already in Menden, Louisiana, and I had never met Prophet T.W. Borns. And when I met him, he shook my hand. The first thing he told me is, you've been poisoned. I had been gone to clinics for like three weeks. They didn't know what was wrong with me. And, uh, and then he explained that I needed a creative miracle, new bones, new blood. I knew I was dying. I knew what that meant. He didn't tell me that God was going to heal me, but he was building my faith. And he just said that we prayed for someone that had a tumor. God healed them, and he told me I was in the school of prayer. And that started a journey of about two years of learning and training. And lo and behold, during the process of, that time, process of time, God gave me a miracle and healed me. But during that time, he invited me to a prayer meeting to uh, speak and minister. And then he called me in the office and so he told me that the Lord showed him I was called to preach. But that wasn't the first time that I kn knew that, but it was another confirmation, uh, a commissioning uh, the authority there. And he invited me for the revival at the Daughter Work Church and his church uh, at the time. And then I thought, you have to overcome your fears. You know, if you're a young lady, uh, in, in ministry, you feel God is calling you. It's so important to be under submission of your pastor. And I still had some, um, some apprehension and fears. And so when, even when Prophet Barnes told me that, I thought, oh my goodness, there's no way my pastor, Pastor Kilgore, is going to allow that because, you know, I just had never spoken to him about that. And of a church of about a thousand people, when I returned home from Minden, uh, well, to church that Sunday, Pastor Kilgore was waiting at the door and he said, Prophet Bournes called me and invited you to go. He said, I've always known you've had a call of God in your life. I've just been waiting for you to come to me. If you feel something, go to your pastor, go to your spiritual authority. Let them confirm you as well. When you have that covering and when you're uh, uh, under subjection, you will always be blessed. To have authority, you have to be under authority. And of course, he released me. That opened the door. It started my journey on minist in ministry. And even when I met my husband, I was working full time as a research chemist and then a grant writer. And I'll never forget it uh, when I got the opportunity when I was appointed uh, when I was called, uh, both my husband and I, uh, to, for this position for World Network of Prayer, we were asked to pray about it, and we did. And so God opened that door, and I left my full-time job, and my husband actually was the one, uh, because he said, the Lord is showing me that you're going to go full-time. And, uh, and sure enough, just within six months, and he said, not only are you going to be speaking at prayer conferences, you're going to be speaking at ladies' conferences. All of that has come to pass. And so those voices of authority, I greatly respect the leadership of men. Even though God is using women, men are in the forefront as well. They're the priests of the home. As Christ lead, they lead. We fall in their subjection in various ways, in a marriage, in church, etc. Thank Amen. You. Thank God. Thank you for sharing that. Very helpful, Brother Cunningham. Two things Sister Shaw has said that's been repeated in this conference over and over that you can't leave this conference without is that if you want to be used by God, there's got to be humility and there's got to be a desire to serve. If you don't have, if you're not submitted, if you're not humble enough to submit yourself to authority, and if you don't have a servant spirit, forget it. You wasted your $25 registration fee to come here. You've got to have those things. There's only one way in the Bible to be great. If you've ever done a Bible study on being greatly used by God, one way. There's not two. One. Three times Jesus said, he that be the greatest among you, let him be the what? Servant. 
servant of all. He that is the greatest will be the servant. Three times he said it. There's no other way to be great in the kingdom of God than you start with a servant spirit. The thing I know about this lady is how she served her pastors. She's talking about them blessing her. I happen to know she serves and still does to this day, serves her leadership and just does it with a willing heart. Raymond Woodward, I've known since he was back in college days, and I watched him serve uh, uh, Ed Goddard. I watched him serve great men of God. I mean, he was the staff person that was making everything work, serving like you can't believe. You've got to have a servant spirit first. Second of all, you've got to humble yourself enough that you can submit to leadership. The biggest failures among us are those that have no headship. They're out there making mistakes day after day after day after day. They're out there messing things up. They're confusing people. They're bringing damnation upon themselves. And it's all because they are not under somebody that's in authority over them. They are their own authority. And that is the surest way to fail in an apostolic church. One of the biggest problems we have in an apostolic church is we compare it to IBM or we compare it to the Navy or we compare it to some business and how you get ahead in business. An apostolic church is not a business. An apostolic church is not a democracy. Who cares what everybody wants to do in an apostolic church? That's why we have apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers in the church. The church is not a democracy. We've got to submit ourselves to the leadership. That's been said from Brother Bernard to Brother Gleason to every speaker that spoke. And if you go home with nothing else, go home with that. I'm 67 years old this year, and I need spiritual authority in my life. Amen. So I think this segues perfectly into the next question. And uh, starting with Brother Bernard Thursday night, and then as Brother Cunningham said, it has appeared almost in every speaker that the local pastor is the gatekeeper of the local church. And the fivefold ministry. Brother Kleindon made this clear, can only be accessed or have access to the local church uh, by the invitation of the pastor. And I want the committee, I want this panel to comment on how does the pastor determine who his five-fold ministry partners are. How, how do we develop a partnership? Is it, you know, uh, you know, just one person, one time, and then that's it, and then we reach for somebody else? Or what does partnership look like for a pastor? Brother Cisco, why don't you start on that? I think first and foremost, these meetings are helping us to clarify what the five-fold ministry is. And so if you are still hazy about these different functions, then you're gonna have a difficulty identifying them yourself and how to invite them in. I've heard Brother Kleindness talk about this a lot. Invite them in. You have to identify and invite them. But I have a lot of people saying, I, I don't have anybody. I want people. I want someone in my life. I think the first thing is you have to understand overall how it works. Try to get a grasp of that. And that's what these conferences, these discovery conferences are saying, oh, okay, I see an example of somebody else that did this. Um, I, for example, when I was evangelizing, I, had, I got to see a lot of different models of how it worked within different churches. And it's not all the same, and it's based on the particular calling of the pastor himself. Because I believe in hyphenated offices. You'll usually have more than one thing that's predominant. You might be a, a teacher, and you know, like Paul was called a prophet and a teacher in Antioch. They were both, they, they toggled between the two. So you'll find that someone has a strength in evangelism and they're also really great at loving people, the real strong, wrong pastoral gifts. You see other people, they're not really strong with the pastoral gifts, they have to have other people around them. They're awesome with authority and leading and casting vision. 
And so depending on what the pastor is or operates in will depend on how, how he identifies and recognizes those other offices and gifts and functions around him that he needs. And so I think that that's first. And then the second thing is, after you get a little more clarity where you can kind of look around the body of Christ and start saying, oh, that's what, oh, that's what that is. That's what that, oh, oh, I didn't know what I was looking at. Like, I, we would see Brother Stone King preaching, and everyone would say, oh, he's just so anointed. And I'm like, there's something else there. It's not just anointing, because I've heard a lot of people that were anointed, and things don't happen the same way. As, and he's preaching the same verses. He's preaching the same He's preaching the same verses that they're preaching, and the response is totally different because of the office that he had and the spiritual authority and the degree of revelation that he had. So I don't know, what am I looking at? I'm looking at something, and then when you get definition, when you get understanding, oh, okay, now that I know what that is, okay, I, now I know how to go and try to approach that and say, I need that function in our church, uh, and then you can invite in, because you have to be able to, as the pastor, articulate how you are received determines the reward that comes into that congregation. If you are presented as a righteous man, you get a righteous man's reward. But if the Bible says if they receive you as a prophet, you'll get a prophet's reward. In other words, how you're received determines the capacity of ministry that comes into that church. We can talk a lot about that today. So I want to be able to present to the body who this is for them to embrace them if I, if I really sense that Bobby Wade, for example, is a prophet, I don't just say, we have an evangelist here speaking for us today. I say, God has sent us a prophet today, and he's going to speak in the spirit, and I want him to operate and flow and function. Church, I want you to receive him as such. Good. Yeah, very good. And so when I did that, oh, it's okay for us to view him that way. And then, man, he... Our church is just on fire at the end because he is saying what God is telling him and everyone goes, well, pastor already said that he's a prophet and we can receive the direction. Now, if I didn't introduce him that way, he might not feel quite as much freedom because maybe I didn't have enough clarity to know what he was. And so these are the things that I think it's really important for us as pastors to get our minds around this, not be intimidated, not be afraid about it, and then say, man, I need this, this helps. Every apostle that I have brought in or someone that I felt operate with apostolic anointing, uh, they brought so much level of expansion into our church. And I look back and I see different uh, men of God. We brought Alan Shaw in at one point, and wow, I mean, just, just on July 4th on a holiday, that's the only time I could get him. And when he spoke, it just, we could just feel things break and open and affirm. And so it's really important for us to do that. And I think when it comes down to a personal relationship, those are formed over time like you did with Brother Stone King. As they come back again and again, you develop, is this something that's going to be a permanent fixture? Is this someone that God has called for us to bring in on a regular basis? We don't know that yet. We will know that in time. And then God will speak to you and say, this is what I'm doing here and give that direction. So that's just my perspective. I'm sure there's much more that we could Thank be saying. You. Thank you, Brother Cisco, and I think that's great. And Brother Kleindienst, you've been a pastor and you've been an evangelist, prophet. So you've seen, you know, sort of both sides of the coin. What does it look like as a pastor developing your partners? What does it look like as an evangelist uh, trying to find a fit for partnership? Well, the best case scenario is that this happens organically. In other words, it's the natural outgrowth of your birth, your walk with the Lord, where you come up, uh, first with your pastor, then who they know, who was in their circle, who you met through them, and they connected you to. I, as a pastor, I always try to bring my uh, top-tier leadership in close to those that we brought into the church to minister. We'd have some kind of dinner at my house or someplace, sit around a table where they could interact uh, with if I brought a prophet or an apostle. And so they would make natural connections. Well, that wouldn't be much, that first connection, but 10 years later as they progressed in ministry, and maybe now they're out pastoring somewhere, they would have a natural opening to call that person and say, hey, would you come minister? Would you speak into my life? And they already know them. They remember when they first met them, you know, when they were serving someone else or in that process. I would say 99% of the relationships I have uh, now 
or a result of somebody I served, uh, Brother Cunningham met him, he connected me to Brother Cole, Brother Cole, Brother Cole connected me to other people. So organic, that's the best case scenario, that you observe it, watch it, look for it, and it naturally unfolds by the people you're connected to. If that's not working, if it's not organically unfolding, you kind of get in a box where it doesn't, it doesn't keep progressing, then you have to get a proactive and you have to reach out for it. And so simply because somebody is, and, and to be honest with you, these are probably the ones that work the least. If somebody is a national prophet or an international prophet, you're going to have a little harder time getting connected to them and them becoming the prophet of your church because of the, the intensity of their engagement to the whole body. Somebody could become the prophet in your life that maybe nobody even knows, yeah. never heard of. Uh, so there's certainly been prophets and apostles through the years that none of us ever heard of, and they weren't even recorded in the Bible. So you reach out to somebody you see, you know, you meet, go to everything, attend everything, be in every fellowship you can be in, because somewhere in the course of participation, you're going to shake a hand, meet somebody, and that's going to be a God connection, especially if you're praying about it and wanting it and reaching for it. Um, as an evangelist, if I see somebody I need to or wanted to be connected to or a church, first I started praying about it. Then if I saw them at a conference or something, I'd go introduce myself, shake their hand, meet them, get to know them. And then maybe they would invite me to preach. So you, you try to make those connections intentionally uh, both ways. That's great. Thank the Lord. We're just going to go just a few more minutes because um, we're going to have a closing impartation before we leave, and then uh, we're going to have a world network of prayer call to prayer and sacrifice that will start at 1 p.m., and so we want to have enough time for transition. Um, this is... This is sort of a negative question, but I think it needs to be put out to the panel today. Brother Cunningham, I probably should have went to this question right after some of the things that he said. But this involves, and Brother Klein has referred to it as well, correction. And what we don't want is everything we've already heard about. We, we're not trying to control anybody, but the fivefold ministry must be humble they must be mutually submitted and they must be accountable. And uh, I've heard lots of stories. In fact, my pastor did not even believe in modern day apostles and prophets. But the irony was that he was an apostle. <laughs> uh, but he suffered at the latter reign and he pushed, it was an over pushback, brother. And he was a teacher, and brother Woodward talked about, you know, uh, over dramatization and so on. And there was an overreach of a pushback. My own mother suffered, her family suffered because of spiritual abuse. And it's amazing that she even survived it as a teenage girl growing up uh, in her parents' home. And God was good to us. And so what do we do when there's one among us that is, let's just say, out of bounds? Someone that uh, is, needs correction. Uh, who has the authority to do that? How do we do that? How do we keep the body of Christ safe uh, and protect the body of Christ? Because I know that there are people that are worried about wildfire and you know people just getting, all they need to do really is listen to Brother Woodward's message today, but let's say we come across a situation like that. We have a district superintendent here, we have pastors here, we have the national evangelist coordinator, we have the assistant general superintendent, we have various voices that we can hear from. Brother Cunningham, I'd like for you to start as bishop and superintendent. What is the best way that perhaps we can uh, bring correction with a redemptive conclusion in mind? I think, first of all, the, the fact that we belong to an organization 
and we've submitted ourselves to an organization that has general superintendent, assistant superintendent, and on a district level, district superintendents, district boards, presbyters in each section, that if we're going to belong to an organization like this, we ought to be submitted to that organization and the leadership that we all elect to lead that organization. And I think it is 1,000% within the right of the organization, especially in as much as we're a ministerial fellowship, to correct our ministers, to give instructions and directions to our ministers. Uh, we've got four or five members of our district board here, and I'll tell you, there's not a more gracious district board on the face of God's green earth than the Virginia district. They're full of grace. We don't go after people in Virginia and try to destroy them. We try to, we try to restore. Now, every now and then you get in a situation where you've got to be very straight, but I can tell you that even in our straightness, our goal is restoration. And so I think if people would trust a little more the organization they belong to, and I'm specifically talking to ministers, if you'd trust a little more the organization you belong to and the people leading that are probably people you voted for to lead, that when they come in and try to help you, you accept that help. You accept the instruction, the guidance, or maybe even correction. Uh, I make jokes on the board. I see board members here, my secretary over there, one of my best friends in the world, but me and him disagree on half of everything we discuss on the board. And, but he's one of the best friends I got in the world. I make jokes on the board. There's, there's 11 of us on the board, and many times the vote is 10 to 1. They all vote against me. And so you, you got to be willing to submit yourself to the system that you're a part of. And so uh, even beyond, I'm not even mentioning fivefold ministry. I think if you've got a spiritual problem, that's when fivefold ministry has got to step in and, and give that instruction. But as far as being a pastor, a minister, a leader functioning in this fellowship, we need to be submitted to the leadership that, that is there. Uh, one of the things I disagree with with the United Pentecostal Church, and there's a couple things, but this is one of them, is that I don't like this business of going around asking people to be your pastor. We change pastors in the UPC like you change socks. You know, there's only three fathers in the Bible. Three. Heavenly Father, your natural father, and your spiritual father. Everybody knows you cannot change who your heavenly father is. There's only one, only ever be one. You cannot change who your uh, natural father is and your heavenly father. Two of the three you can't change. But the spiritual father, we change those about every other week. My pastor says something I don't like, I'll go ask John Doe to be my pastor. 3,000 miles from where I live, that ought to be a safe pastoral relationship. Hello? I don't let nobody make me their pastor. I was just at Landmark. A, a pastor come out of the audience, come up and sit down beside me and said, I'd like you to be my pastor. I said, I thought you come out of so-and-so's church. He said, I did, but I want you to be my pastor. I said, no, I'm not going to do it. I said, I'll be your friend. Be glad to be your friend. You can call me anytime you want, but I'm not going to be your pastor. And we need, to, we need to be more loyal in the United Pentecostal Church than we are. I know people that have had 10 pastors and all 10 of them are still alive. They didn't get a new pastor because one died. They just didn't like what that one was saying. And when this all first started coming out, this whole thing started coming out. Would you be my pastor? Would you be? I got all excited. I thought, wow, man, ain't I something. Everywhere I go, someone wants me to be their pastor. Everywhere I go, they want me to be their minister. Let me tell you what I figured out about that. They only want you to be their pastor until you actually try to pastor them. When you pastor them, they start looking for another one. And so to me, the answer is submit yourself to the, to the organization, to the structure that, that you chose. You know, there ain't nobody in here has got a license that any of us superintendents went out and begged them to come to the United Pentecostal Church. You're in it because you ask. 
You did the work. You did the pursuing. And then to get in it and not, and not be submitted and not supported and not, not, not follow the leadership that you've put in place is wrong. And so I think that's where it starts right there. It's not a spiritual answer. It's a natural answer. But I think that's where it starts. Thank you, Brother Cunningham. Well said. Brother uh, Woodward, would you like to comment on uh, how we bring correction and adjustment with a redemptive conclusion? I think that if you can't self-correct, you are going to resist correction anyway. There you go. You, you have to have something in you that says, I want to be right. Uh, I want to have integrity. I'm the same on the inside as I am on the outside. And so you have to be able to self-correct in prayer with God. And then to me, the next phase of that is you have to connect among the brethren or correct among the brethren. And what I mean by that, uh, it was such an honor to speak to you this morning. I walked next door and Bishop Cunningham and Brother Kleinus were walking the other way. And I said to him, uh, Bishop, I just want to make sure that that was okay this morning. I don't ever want to speak uh, to leaders and somehow limit apostolic authority. If you ever see that in any sentence I say or anything I say, I want you to not just pull my coattail. You can take my coat off and rip it up. You know, I, 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 I want to correct with the brethren. I want to make sure that, that Brother Gleason and Brother Cunningham and all these other men, uh, men and Sister Shaw on this panel that I, I asked them, was that okay? And I see that in every member of this panel, every member. Uh, Brother Herring hasn't spoken yet. Uh, did you notice this yet? Uh, he hasn't spoken. His humility impacts me. So used by God. He travels all around our fellowship, and he's got that big, deep voice, and he's amazing and anointed. <laughs> and, and, and he preached this morning. I wish. And I one more thing. When he preached in our church, he said, if you don't love Bishop Gleason, you're going to hell. <laughs> and you believe it because of the bass in the voice. He said this morning we were over there in the other building and he was, we, we just kind of talk, all of us. And he said something, just his humility. Oh, I'm just a child, you know. And uh, Sister Shaw gets up first thing and reads that passage. Say thou not, I am a child. I said, God doesn't usually correct me that fast. Humility, uh, we keep coming back to it because it's so important. You won't correct Brother Gleason unless you have humility. And so we could have all the five-fold ministry in the world and all the uh, elders and, and the structure. But if somebody doesn't have it in your heart to seek correction, you'll rebel against correction. You make sure your heart's right, number one. I would like for our panel to please stand. Brother Gleason, I'd like to make one comment on that. If I could, I can do it in 10 seconds. Um, I think it's important that you make known to the people you have authority over who is in authority over you. So, for instance, in our home, my wife and I, of course, we've been married 39 years. We've had a conversation. If I, thank you, if I get to a point you think you're, you don't know what to do with me, I'm being abusive, I'm uncontrollable, here's who you call. Here's the person that you call on me. My church knew when I pastored. If you just think I'm out of control, here's who you call. Now, these days, it looks like everybody just calls Brother Gleason and Brother Bernard to report me. <laughs> so I guess they think they're the only people who can fix me now. But I think it's important to let the people that you're leading know, if you just think I've just lost it and I'm, I need correction and you don't know what to do with me, Call that person, and then they will correct me. And they have to be somebody that loves you, but is not intimidated by you. I would like to invite everybody to stand. We have one final prayer, one final blessing. I'm going to ask our panel to join with Brother Cunningham. He's going to just speak a blessing Jesus. over this conference. And then we're going to go into our world network of prayer, one hour prayer around the world. Brother Cunningham. 
Thank you, Brother Gleason. Let me say thank you to all of you for attending and supporting this meeting. What a tremendous blessing you have been. Again, I'm 67 years old this year. Uh, when they talk about being called to the ministry, I can honestly tell you, I don't remember a time in my life I didn't know I was called to preach. Four, five, six years old, my mom's got pictures of me up on the table preaching to the family. I just always knew, even when I wasn't acting right, I knew there was a calling on my life. I love this church. I think I know this church. But I've learned things in the last three days I've never heard of before. I'm going to leave here richer. Anybody feel like you're leaving here richer? I have been impressed by the number of people that have come to this meeting, the number of people that registered for it. I've been impressed by your giving. I don't know if you've heard it or not, but when I ask you to give and Brother Woodward asks you to give, we've, the last two nights offerings have been $36,000. This conference is paid for. That's you. And then the thing that's impressed me the most is the way you have responded session after session after session. I can tell when someone says something that's revelation by the way you respond. And I think we've had a lot of revelation in this meeting. I wonder if I could do a little survey. How many of you are leaving here with one or more things you never knew before that's going to impact your life and ministry? I want you to look at that. I don't think there's a hand in the building, not up. I don't think any of us came here that already knew it all, not even the speakers. That's what they talk about in private over here, telling each other, oh, you helped me, you helped me, you helped me, you changed me. And so I thank God for meetings like this. When I was advertising this to my church, and I'm, uh, you know, I, I might, my, maybe I'm an evangelist because I can embellish things sometimes trying to sell people on stuff. But when I was telling the church about this, I said, there's not one Bible school on the face of the earth that you could go to that's going to teach what we teach, what's going to be taught here Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. There's not one university, and we're only about a mile from the biggest Christian university in America, and they can't teach what we've had the last three days here. There's not one book available for sale that has in it what you've heard the last three days. There's been no other meeting you could go to that's had in it what we've had the last three days. We are privileged to have got to be a part of a meeting like this. What a privilege. What a blessing. I want all, the, all you teachers, leaders, sponsors, come up here and help me, would you? Let's just line them across the front. Oh, no, right up here. Right up here. Come on, right out here with us. Come on. Bishop Hill, come stand here with me, will you? Come around here and stand with me. Bishop Hill, we got a cool thing going here. We've been, we've been reaching out to all the apostolic bishops in our area. I've got 12 bishops right now that are having lunch with me every month. Brother Hill decided that we were going to be partners in this. This is the first bishop I reached out to. And we got 12 now coming to lunch. Once a quarter, we have a one church rally on a Sunday night. The last one we had, it was standing room only just about in this building. And, and God is bringing the apostolic church together. And I'm thankful for that. Praise God. But I want, I want this, this 
leadership group here of anointed men and women of God. Many of them operate, most of them operate in the fivefold ministry. I want Bishop Hill, I want us to raise our hands across you. I want you to lift your hands just for the purpose of receiving. Would you do that? We're going to bless you. We're going to bless you. This ministry, fivefold ministry, bishops, we're going to bless you. Everybody help me. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, God, I bless your people. I ask you, Lord, right now that you would open the very windows of heaven and you would pour out a blessing on your precious people that they don't have room enough to receive. I know, Lord God, that this meeting has been a blessing to them spiritually. God, they've received revelation. Oh, God, you have ministered to us through your servants. That's a special blessing. But God, as they leave this place, as they leave this place, God, let them walk in blessing and favor. Let them go back to their individual towns with favor. Let them go back to their churches with favor. Let your blessings be upon them. In a heavy way, I pray. In the name of the Lord, in the name of the Lord, in the name of the Lord, in the name of the Lord. Jesus. Jesus. Jesus! Mm. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to clap your hands to the Lord and say the words, I receive it to Him. I want you to speak it. Speak it. I receive it. I receive God's blessings and favor upon my life. Yes! One more prayer. Very quickly, one more prayer. The devil came before God, which there's a whole Bible study there of the devil having to go tell God what he's up to. Never heard anybody preach or teach on it in my life. The devil came before God to give a report of where he was and what he was doing because he has to do that. And God said, have you considered my servant Job? And the devil kind of gets a little agitated and answers, you know I can't touch him. You put a hedge around him. I can't penetrate that hedge. Now, people have said, why did God say, have you considered my servant Job? I'm, I'm a simple man. And my simple answer is, God wanted to make him say the words. You know I can't touch him. <laughs> you put a hedge around him. He wanted it to go on the record that the devil knows he can't touch somebody God put a hedge around. Now, I'm a realist, and it gets me in trouble a lot because I say what I think. But I think there's more hell going on in this room in the lives of God's people than we can shake a stick at. I think there's folks in here that came here not knowing which way to turn, not knowing what the answer is, not knowing which way's up. They're trying to figure out things in their marriage, their home, their finances. Their own mind is playing games with them. I think all of that exists here as spiritual as we are. Here's what we're going to pray before I turn this back over. I want you to lay your hands on people on both sides of you. And here's what you're going to pray. Nothing else but this. Listen to me. I want you to pray a hedge on the person on both sides of you. I want you to pray a hedge around them that no evil spirit can penetrate. I want you to pray a hedge around them that no human being with evil intentions can influence them. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, God, I pray a hedge around, brother, 
hill right now. I pray a hedge around Brother Kleindens right now. Put a hedge around them that no evil spirit can penetrate. Put a hedge around them that no human being with evil intentions can influence them. In I'm actually praying this for you. If there something's breaking in this room right now come on somebody it's working it's working oh you're going to leave here different than you came you're going to walk out of here and the devil's going to know I can't touch him I can't touch her there's a hedge around him Huh? One of you guys grab a bottle of oil. You got to go, you and one. I want everybody to point your hand over here. Brother Lyon's family brought him here to be anointed and prayed for. He's in the last stages of cancer. Let me tell you what I... They called me at 7 o'clock this morning. And the first thing God told me was, he's healed any way it goes. Hold on. Hold on. There's two things that can happen. He can be healed and the cancer will leave his body. Or if God decides to take him, the moment he quits breathing here, he gets a heavenly body. He's absent from this body, present with the Lord, where there's no more sickness, no more pain, no more. Any way it goes, he's healed. Come on, let the healing happen right now. Thank you, oh God, for healing. Thank you, God, for healing. Indo bo shata ta 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 ya bahando, anda ya da da bo hoko to yo lo da da baha. Ando rudi anda da 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 mo shata ta da 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 baha. I curse cancer in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I curse cancer. Hata ye na mahata. Oh. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. I think you ought to clap your hands to God for what we feel in this building. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye people. I'm done. Glory, glory, glory. Glory, glory, glory. Let me tell you something. There's a reason the Bible tells us. Somebody needs to listen to me.
Wasn't it you that said if you've got... Everybody listen for one second. If you're in this room and God ever healed you of cancer, you were diagnosed with cancer, and today you are healed, you are free from it, would you raise your hand? Hold it up high. I want you that got your hands up to step out of where you are and come up here. Brother Kleindens preached to us that when you survive something like cancer, you have dominion over cancer. I want every one of you that just raised your hands to come up here and put your hands on Brother Lyons. I'm telling you, it's already beginning. It's already starting. Just like that. It's not spiritual authority. Folks, that's spiritual authority. That is dominion that you're seeing demonstrated right now. Yes. That's my wife. Had cancer at two different parts of her. Let me, let, let me lead you in one more prayer. Wasn't going to do this, but I'm going to now. We got four minutes left before we go live in our worldwide prayer meeting. By the way, the whole world's going to join us at one o'clock live for prayer. So please don't be piddling around when we start praying. Let's pray. The whole world is literally watching. But let me tell you something about prayer. 67 years old, ministry 40 years. Listen to 46 or 7 years I've been in ministry. Pastored my first church at 19. God helped them poor people I tried to pastor. Listen to me carefully. I don't always know how to pray. Paul said sometimes we don't know what to pray. Sometimes I pray for the wrong thing. Paul said, sometimes you pray amiss. Sometimes you pray in generalities that just didn't get nothing done. There's a lot of times I promise you I have prayed for God to do something only to find out later I was praying for the wrong thing all the time I was praying. And that's the reason they introduced us to intercessory prayer. Because he said, when you don't know what to say, when you don't know how to pray... The Spirit maketh intercession for us. And so I find myself at this stage in my life praying in the Holy Ghost. Jude said, building up your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. I find myself praying in the Holy Ghost more and more. Now, there's some things you have to do in English. You've got to repent in English. Can't do that in, the, in tongues. You've got to worship in English. Because if you're doing tongues and it's the Holy Ghost praying through you, it isn't you worshiping. Worship's what I give God. You got to worship in English. You got to be thankful in English. There's a bunch of stuff you got to do in English. But every now and then you come up against a problem in your life that you really don't know how God's going to answer it, when it's going to be answered, who God's going to use. You need to learn how to pray in the Holy Ghost on a regular basis. So would you raise your hands right now and open your mouth and pray in the Holy Ghost with authority. Don't just beat around the bush. Pray in the Holy Ghost with authority. Where's that old?
Holy Ghost with authority. Pray with authority. Wad up your fist if you have to. Pray in the Holy Ghost with authority. Hadalala la 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 la